are back on the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escal. Do Americans have economic rights the way they have the rights enshrined in uh, the Constitution and its amendments? Franklin Delano Roosevelt thought so, which is why he laid out what he called his Economic Bill of Rights. My next guests also think so. Both of them are uh, regulars or semi-regulars on the program. Both of them, I'm honored to say, are good friends. Ellen Minsky is the Executive Director of Progressive Democrats for America. Harvey J.K. is a historian, sociologist, and the author of a number of books, uh, several of which we've discussed here on this program. And the two of them have issued a call for progressive candidates to embrace an economic bill of rights. And they join us now. So first of all, Harvey and Alan, welcome back to the Zero Hour. It's a, it's a pleasure. Always great to see you and to, and to be here and actually to converse with you and Alan at the same time is great. I feel exactly the same way. And uh, so let's talk about the Economic Bill of Rights. You guys have published this in several locations, including Common Dreams, and uh, uh, you've framed it as a call to progressive candidates and office holders. So before we go into the embracing part, what is your conception of an Economic Bill of Rights? Well, it, it's rooted... It's rooted in FDR's call for an economic bill of rights in January 1944. Uh, footnote to that is that he actually began the call in 1932 during his campaign for the presidency when he first called for an economic declaration of rights. And this developed over the course of his presidential terms. But in 1943, and this is what really led to him coming out in a State of the Union address with this message. He asked a, a survey research group out of Princeton University to do a national survey and to ask Americans what would they like to see? What did they want after the war? And what they discovered was that, as one pollster put it, they wanted everything. But in particular, they wanted certain kinds of guarantees. They wanted a guarantee of, of health care. They wanted a guarantee of a job at a living wage. They wanted a guarantee that young people could pursue education as far as their intellects and talents might take them. So in other words, they were looking for what FDR came to call a second bill of rights or an economic bill of rights. And I'll, I'll just add, and I won't go on too long, that his call garnered incredible, massive support from both the American Federation of Labor and from the S Congress of Industrial Organizations, which at the time were separate federations. And the CIO campaigned fiercely, I mean, really aggressively for Roosevelt in terms of the Economic Bill of Rights. And I'll just further add to that, that there was an organization, well, m almost every single civil rights organization, which was growing at the time during World War II, came out in support of it. I mean, it really did have a tremendous momentum. He didn't necessarily believe he was going to control Congress enough, given the Southern Democrats, to enact it. But he wanted this to be a vision for the party and for the nation going forward in the post four years. And I, I'll come back to the degree to which that actually has been the case or was the case, at least for many years. I'll just say that uh, that it, our call is rooted in that, but it's it's transformed or, if you like, amended, revised, updated to be a 21st century economic bill of rights. I noticed that uh, that uh, modification, the toy, the addition of the words 20th, 21st century, and I'm going to want to come back to that, Harvey and Alan. But Alan uh, Mitski, I wanted to ask you in particular, uh, you, you and I both have labored in the ranks of uh, progressive activism for a number of years now, you more so than I, but uh, what made you and Harvey feel that this was a time to issue a call of this kind? Well, uh, the history of uh, American politics over the past decade, um, I think we saw a constitutive shift, especially on the plane of domestic politics with the 2016 election cycle. And I think after the 2016 election cycle, my interpretation is that we basically have three major tendencies vying for political power inside the two-party system. I mean, I know people have various 
analyses of the coalition of the two parties, and they say there are really nine parties backed into two parties. Well, this is really much more broad stroke, and I think it's very common sense to everyone listening, which is that we have the Trump reactionaries on the right wing of the political spectrum. We have in the middle what I would argue now are basically a conservative political formation that runs from the Romney wing of the Republican Party through the classical Clinton wing of the Democratic Party. They are neoliberals. They have been involved in designing and implementing an American economy over the past three or four decades, and they've produced what we have for our current social economic relations in the society. So they're the status quo. That's why I actually deem them as conservatives. They're looking to conserve what we have presently. And then we have the progressives following Bernie Sanders' really groundbreaking race and uh, uh, campaign in 2016. He introduced a whole set of um, political ideas that are in operation around the world, but have become either very atrophied in the United States or don't exist at all. It was reflective of the politics of Occupy and pretty much is reflective of the state of mind of the American people following the market crash of 07, 08, after which really the American dream sort of broke like Humpty Dumpty and never was really put back together again. And so of the three political tendencies, I argue only the progressives have a template for producing the kind of economy that the American people want. Again, the center group, which by the way, shows that we basically had, they talk about a foreign policy consensus among the two parties. In the rear view mirror, we can see the last 30 years as having, since Clinton's presidency, having basically a domestic policy consensus between the two parties. The Trump people on the right, they're basically smoke and mirrors. It's because he was president, he had a Republican majority in both houses. All he did is produce tax cuts for the rich. The only adjustment was around trade and only marginally so, okay? So only, again, the progressives want to see something, the transformation the American people want. Uh, for me, this was a huge motivation in uh, approaching uh, Professor Kay about right, drafting a 21st century economic bill of rights, calling upon progressives to embrace it, to distinguish themselves from the other two political tendencies, and including the conservative corporate wing of the Democratic Party. Uh, and, uh, and so this is, uh, this is where we are right now. And I think uh, the, the second really salient point about this proposal is it's not utopian fantasy. Almost all of these measures are in effect in every other prosperous technological industrial society in the world today, from East Asia, through countries like Australia, New Zealand, and then up in Western Europe, Canada even. And you see that just you take away aggregate wealth as an index and the United States is basically at the bottom of all other social economic indices, especially social indices. When you look at crime, when you look at family, when you look at depression, when you look at education, when you look at health, when you look at diet, but just across the board, the United States just basically ranks at or near the bottom mass incarceration. There's nothing like those things. Homelessness. There's nothing like any of these things in any of these countries. And so the United States population has an appetite for this. They just need it introduced to them in a very clear and concise way. And hopefully that's what Professor Kay and I have achieved with this. And I want to frame my next question to you, Harvey Kay, as a historian, to you, Alan Minsky, as a student of American political dynamics. I hope you'll bear with me a minute while I lay out the context for what my question really is, which is uh, the other day when I was being interviewed, instead of being the interviewer, I was asked whether I thought uh, Biden was as progressive a president, at least by intent, as FDR was. And my answer was that he was not, whatever good proposals he's offered, that one of the fundamental things about the Franklin Roosevelt presidency was that he re-envisioned and recast the relationship between the American people and their government. And it was a vision that lasted, I would argue, at least for 30 years. You mentioned the 1968, you know, the shifts after 1968. But for a period of time, uh, Roosevelt allowed, uh, enabled Americans to envision their government in a different way. And the economic Bill of Rights, as well as his four freedoms, was a big part of that. That in addition to what we'd always been taught about uh, freedom from government interference, seizure of property, uh, those types of restrictions in speech, practice of speech and religion and so on, that we had the rights 
that our rights included the right to eat, the right to live, the right to a good job, the right to survival. This was a different kind of America. So I said FDR was much more transformative and expansive in his vision of what government could be, but that we haven't seen that from any, uh, really from any president since Johnson did the, uh, of course, did the um, did Medicare, and that was a major program. Um, but I would argue that what you guys are proposing here is a reinvigoration of that different kind of uh, relationship of a polity to their government that Roosevelt talked about. What do you think of that? Am I off base or maybe Harvey, you could start out? Well, I, I, as I said to you before, uh, Joe Biden is no FDR. <laughs> Let's start there, okay? Um, and one of the reasons, in fact, well, among the reasons that, that Alan and I really took this, this project up is that there seems at this moment a progressive set, of, there's a whole host of progressive possibilities. So that it, as much as the media and all of us are fully aware of this crisis of democracy and the media frames it in ter terms of the Trump and reactionary threat, a crisis itself is also driven by possibilities. And clearly the centrists or conservative Democrats or corporate Democrats and conservatives, they are themselves very anxious about the possibility of a broad progressive politics emerging in the wake of Bernie Sanders campaigns. And so the idea for us in part was to sort of not just lay out an agenda, which the Democratic Party does itself, but the idea is to give it a historical and visionary framework, these kinds of things. And that's one of the ways in which FDR really helped to transform American understandings of themselves and of government's relation to them, to that is, to the people. I mean, as I said, he began in 1932 talking about an economic declaration of rights, and he sustained that. I I've did a whole book on the impact of his call for uh, or post-war world uh, characterized by four freedoms. Now, and one of the other things is that we really did, as you were saying, have a long age of Roosevelt in many ways. And maybe I can even be very specific about that. We know about the Great Society, the War on Poverty, but I doubt if anyone, other than those of us who did the did the, the sort of historical research, know or remember. I wasn't old enough to. Well, actually, I read the the party platforms when I was eleven years old in 1960. The Democratic Party platform in 1960 opens up with a, a commitment on the part of the Democrats to pursue and make real the rights of man, which was meant to be an expression of their commitment to civil rights. And, and then they went on, and it was written by Charles, by Chester Bowles, who was a late leading figure in the Roosevelt administration. And if you read it, it's laid out one by one by one, the entire platform, in terms of FDR's Economic Bill of Rights. So it was there very much at the heart of, of the Democratic Party. And then A. Philip Randolph picked up on that in by offering in 1965 a freedom budget, which was framed by the four freedoms and inside lays out pretty much what the Economic Bill of Rights meant. And then on a tragic note, not long before his assassination, Martin Luther King himself, Martin Luther King Jr. actually called in print, I believe it was Look Magazine and the Guardian uh, newspaper, I believe over in Britain, for an Economic Bill of Rights. And so and when we think about it, it's it's there is a part of that age of Roosevelt. And I think that I think in part the attacks that have taken place by the right against Roosevelt and the Democrats, who for so many years turned their back on the Roosevelt legacy, that in some ways it's that turning away from an attack on the Roosevelt legacy is a kind of anxiety and fear hmm. on the part of conservatives because Americans have come to understand that real freedom requires a recognition of economic rights. I, I hope that gets at uh, oh, 100%. what you're saying. And Alan, did you have anything to add on that topic? I want to go back to your question about Biden. And, and um, one of the points that I really wanted in, and I actually haven't reviewed this too much with Professor K, but I like the way that we said this is a call for uh, progressive candidates and uh, office holders. Because we did see a shift in the Democratic caucus um, this last cycle 
um, as uh, Build Back Better was being negotiated. Remember, um, <laughs> Senator, uh, rather, Congressman Richie Neal approved a $3.5 trillion version of Build Back Better. Um, we had a number of Democrats um, in the House not push back. Only about 15 to 20 of them really pushed back. Now, even at $3.5 trillion, was that um, a set of policies that matched up in their progressivism with what we're outlining in the Bill of Rights? No, Medicare for all was was not on the table, right? Housing as a human right was not on the table, but it went much further than anything we'd really seen going all the way back to LBJ. And of course, this was pushed along by the reality of the pandemic. You know, what were the Democrats going to do following the Relief Act, which matched the CARES Act, and to go beyond it? So you had this, but you had a really um, strong, uh, relative to recent American history, very strong uh, progressive agenda, economic agenda laid out in the certainly the 3.5 trillion version and even the 1.8 trillion dollar version before mansion and cinema basically sunk the whole thing and so uh, we do want to hold out for uh, people who are elected office holders to have an opportunity to come over because i think neoliberalism the basically economic structures of the past three decades <laughs> i mean if these three tendencies were just competing and they had to lay out the vision they have for the society to the american public tragically because there's so many reactionaries in, in the american electorate i think the neoliberals would take a distant third there's not a lot of things there for people to really hang their hat on except for you're going to live a life all of you in the general population are going to live a life of continued economic precarity so we saw the democratic uh, caucus move somewhat to the progressive side of things and if we want to see people have a change of heart and move over to the you know progressive uh, channel within the democratic party who maybe We've been thought of as more central centrist Democrats previously. We welcome them with open arms, but we do want them to fully embrace the economic bill of rights because we think this is uh, something that's doable within American society. And we think the American people, when they become aware of it, will embrace it much more than the maintenance of a life of continued debt penury, which is basically what is held out for the working and middle classes of the American the vast majority of the American population today. With very little social mobility, too. I mean, if you want, again, a vision of things like the American dream, classically understood home ownership, upward social mobility, I think we're presenting the case for that, uh, not the reactionaries and, and not the neoliberal centrists. I want to get into the specifics of your eight point 21st century economic bill of rights. One last thing before we do, though, about if you were Biden or the Democratic Party today, the bill back better original $3.5 trillion package included some really good things, but I felt that it was lacking a cohering philosophy or strategy that one of the reasons why it struggled, the individual items within it polled well. But I think particularly in the media, it was covered as merely a dollar figure, but it was also a package of different things that I felt lacked a kind of theme, like a hook in a song that people could latch on to. So uh, it seems to me that something like what you're proposing could be a hook for a broader agenda. And I just want to make that comment before we move on, if you want to disagree or agree or whatever you want. That'd be to great. In fact, I'm going to ask Alan to write a song after we get off. <laughs> well, I've got a guitar right here. But, uh, you guys that's, that's, that's RJ's turf. That's definitely. Yeah. Right. That's true. I, I apologize, RJ. That's definitely your turf. <laughs> Yeah. So let's, um, that's all right. Uh, I mean, but uh, let's go through the eight points that you put together. Did you, first of all, did you guys, how did, did you just like kind of brainstorm? Did you talk? To oh, yeah. Folks? oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> that for yes sure. Both, or? But there were certain priorities we had. We wanted to keep the list limited. Mm -hmm. We didn't want it to become as long as the U S constitution. Even we wanted it to be the kind of thing that people could read, grab hold of. And, you know, I don't think we put it in these terms, but put it on a card and put it in their back pocket if they had to, that kind of thing. Right? right? Well, you would agree, Alan, we want to keep oh, it crisp. I, I, absolutely. And one of the things we built off of is, is, is unfortunately, uh, Bernie Sanders, well, fortunately, in, in 2020, he embraced an economic bill of rights. Unfortunately, he really didn't push it. Not many people who even were direct directly involved in the campaign, remember that he he uh, advocated for a 21st century economic bill of rights. You can still find it up on the 2020 Sanders campaign website. It is exceptionally succinct. Um, it has, I think, uh, six measures, all of which are about 
six to eight words long. So it's incredibly concise. And we built off of that. We uh, brought in a few of our own considerations. And then we also added in um, a, a very good article by three uh, economists, uh, Mark Paul, William Darity, and Derek Hamilton from 2018, where they proposed a, a 21st century economic bill of rights. So we were sort of drawing off of those, of course, also the Rooseveltian template and a few of our own ideas. We use the word recreation, borrowing from Roosevelt, which wasn't included in any of the other more recent versions that I mentioned. Um, we also included broadband internet, which wasn't mentioned in any of them, which we feel is essential uh, because there's incredible class divide in terms of class and by the way, geographic divide in terms of who has access to broadband internet still in the society. So, um, yeah, we wanted to keep it concise and we wanted to hit all the major points we thought were essential. And that template was drawn broadly off of what Roosevelt proposed in 1944. And, and I, we would be remiss if, if we didn't note that we also did uh, have a conversation with Nina Turner so that we would have perspective that perhaps Alan and I couldn't readily right. bring to, to, the, to it. Yeah, and also one other person was uh, a candidate who just announced down in Georgia 13, Senator Vincent Ford of a long time. Oh, right. oh sure. Know him well. Um, right. And I would, you know, that Bernie's uh, Economic Bill of Rights, uh, I would agree, it's extremely well written. Who I wonder who helped him write that. Um, the uh, I think we should we should probably let people know <laughs> that you were a chief writer for Bernie in that particular campaign. I was campaign. his chief writer that in that campaign, yeah. Um, so let's go through your items. If, if we uh, if we can um, briefly, uh, as I said, you have eight of them. Uh, it's your, your uh, it's you write a 21st century economic bill of rights will establish that all Americans are entitled to one the right to a useful job that pays a living wage and to a voice in the workplace through a union and collective bargaining. So what you're saying is, in effect, it sounds like, among other things, not only support for expanded union power, labor power, which we all support, but it sounds like almost like a job guarantee. Oh, yeah. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead, Alan. No, you, all yours. My answer okay. to that is, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, FDR was absolutely clear all the time that the, the idea underlying the New Deal was that Americans should have the right to a job. And in fact, when he first signed into law, the National Industrial Recovery Act in 1933, he made it clear that although it only included the minimum wage idea, which, by the way, was radical in its own, mo in its own moment, he said no company that operates in the United States should be allowed to continue to operate unless it paid a living wage. So this was always very, very fundamental to him. In his original Economic Bill of Rights, he did not have the right to a voice in the workplace because he had already signed into law the National Labor Relations Act in 1935, which definitely placed the federal government behind the efforts of workers to organize. And at that point, he did not envision what would later come to pass in 1947, when briefly the Republicans controlled Congress and they passed the Taft-Hartley Act, Act, which really sort of was to take out the power of labor from the workplace didn't fully do that, but it definitely hampered labor's ability to organize, which is why the South became a right to work region of the United States. Yeah, and we, we did debate whether we were going to include the language about the uh, voice in the workplace in unions because uh, it wasn't included originally and hadn't been actually in any of the previous uh, uh, versions that we mentioned. But we felt that at this hour, uh, the unions have been under such attack. And even if there's a slight uptick in organizing around the country right now, they remain so under attack compared to the 40s, compared to the 60s, that we really needed to elevate that right and put it in as a right into the Bill of Rights. Well, I'm glad you did. And uh, I have a, th a personal theory about the Taft-Hartley Act, but I'll have to wait for another time, uh, ah. another conversation. Your, your item number two, uh, but I certainly don't disagree with anything you said about it. The right, uh, your item number two, the right to comprehensive quality health care. Um, it, 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 it's interesting, and I noticed that one of your commenters in Common Dreams brought this up. Uh, uh, somebody said, ah, well, I call it Medicare for all, but uh, you must have made a conscious decision not to use that phrasing. So what are you saying here about well, comprehensive? I think, I, I think rhetorically, the 
pressure there is on the word right. When we say that it is a right to comprehensive medical care, that uh-huh. means it's across the board and everybody gets it. Right. And uh, we're not we're not outlining specific policies in the bill, but uh, mm-hmm. we feel that the only thing that matches up with that that's on the table right now is Medicare for all. Um, go yeah, ahead. there was a term lost in the way the Medicare for all shorthand and hashtag has really become a symbol of the of an idea that was previously what at least I think you and I grew up um, RJ with the idea that it would be universal health care right and nobody seems to use that term any longer and I think that's part I want to just go on record as saying I think the problem arose during the Obama Hillary primary season people were throwing around universal health care and neither one of them spoke in those terms and oddly enough, Hillary spoke more in that direction than Obama ever did. And I think, it's, I think it's not to, you know, pull back into that kind of rhetoric, but comprehensive quality health care, universal comprehensive quality health care. I actually wrote extensively during that primary about the misapplication of language in terms of throwing around the term universal health care, but they often use the phrase universal coverage. Uh, which- yeah does not guarantee right. access to health care that won't leave you bankrupt. Right. So that was a little bit of verbal sleight of hand uh, uh, from the neoliberal uh, elite you guys were describing earlier. So comprehensive quality health care, uh, and we can debate the specifics later as we enact it into law, but the idea that every American should be able to access health care and presumably meaning without being prevented by cost or anything else. Right. Yeah, and also mental um, mental health, I assume, is there for comprehensive. Um, that's my assumption. Yes. Uh, a few people have nudged me and said that, that should be included, but I feel it's just there because it says comprehensive. And dental, hearing, uh, vision, and so on, I assume. Yeah. Um, let's get to the next one. Uh, the right to a complete cost-free public education, and access to broadband internet. Do you mean free access to broadband internet? I would assume so. That would be my expectation, but it may well be that there would be some you know, local taxes or whatever. I, but my feeling is that we are talking about universal capacity to access. And once again, I don't want it to, everyone to think, well, that's all well and good for somebody who you know, can afford to access it. Or, right. Okay, so... And by cost-free, I assume you mean tuition-free. People might have to pay for books or whatever. Well, maybe not books, but we wouldn't necessarily expect them to be able to, you know, go. You know, it's always come up the question of free public higher education, specifically right. as Bernie presented. Did that mean you had to stay inside the state you were in, et cetera, et cetera? I mean, those are questions to be worked out, I think, in policy terms. And, and of course, there are countries like Germany that offer a stipend for people to study so that it's truly free. But yeah. but I assume that you would put this these sorts of things in the category you were mentioning earlier of to be debated as these rights are translated into legislation, right? I, I wish we could call up FDR on that question because you know what? It was under the FDR administration that the National Youth Administration was created in the mid-30s. And their ambition was to keep people in school and they were willing to pay them to do so. That is, and that was the makings of work study, the, the origins of work study. So it's a good mm-hmm. question. Maybe we should be talking about making sure that they don't have to starve even as they're studying. Alan, you have anything to add here before we go on to the next one? No, again, uh, one of the reasons I think we, we didn't feel any pressure to have more specificity around programs is that, again, the Bernie template and all of the previous templates, including all the way going back to Roosevelt, don't specify. So we're pretty much working off the template yeah. as it began in 1944, and it's been uh, regenerated through to the pr- this present version. The right. Okay, let's move on then to number four: the right to decent, safe, affordable housing. You know, the Kerner Commission, uh, fifty plus years ago, in re- oh, yeah. in uh, looking at. Uh, the causes of uh, urban uh, uprisings and violence recommended that the government build 10 million units of new housing. And that was 50 plus years ago. So again, you're not going to specifics here, but I assume you guys are uh, acknowledging in this that today's policies, uh, whether it's uh, vouchers or what have you, are, are clearly insufficient 
to meet the housing needs of the American people. Is that a fair statement? There should be nobody who is homeless in this country who does not want to be not living in a domicile. Nobody. Sorry? There should be nobody in this country who is homeless who does not want to live in a domicile. Obviously, if somebody's predilection is to go around camping and to live that way, that's their right. But uh, nobody should be homeless in the, in the country with our industrial and technological capacity. It's an absolute crime against humanity that it exists, and it is legion. And, uh, and I do think it's unfortunate that the progressive left has not elevated housing as a human right uh, to the degree that they have emphasized things like Medicare for all. I understand it's part of the Green New Deal. But when people think of the Green New Deal, they think about, you know, uh, you know, uh, obviously the environment and then employment. But housing as a human right needs to be elevated. And, and not only that, talk about something in terms of housing costs that um, absolutely is just gutting the lives and the life prospects of what the balance of the population in the United States currently. It's ridiculous. And it needs to be addressed and addressed very aggressively by the progressive left. Yeah, I know that, by the way, the other two groups aren't going to do it at all. You know. As as long as we have, we're going to be on YouTube, I just want to do one show and tell if I can, okay? This is the freedom budget that A. Philip Randolph provided, and he specified various things. And among them, am I, is my finger going to the right one? The A decent home for every American family. And it really was to be a budget that was going to wipe out poverty in America. And it was not fantastic. It was real, very real. And it had the support of 150 major figures in American public life from labor, education, uh, labor unions, you name it. And it's those kinds of things that have always been a part of this American imagination. It, the housing one is one that's absolutely fundamental to this. And of course, it's in this inseparable in a way from item number one, the rightful right to a useful job that pays a living wage. I'm thinking the studies that have been done showing that there are parts of the country where you can only get decent housing and and survive on thirty six dollars an hour in places where the minimum wage is seven dollars and twenty five cents an hour. So right. it seems to me those two are uh, clearly they need to be separate items, but deeply inter interconnected, don't you think? Absolutely. Well, let's move on. To to number six, the right to a meaningful endowment of resources at birth and a secure retirement. You skipped one. I'm sorry? Skip you five. skipped number five. Oh, I skipped one. Oh, well, and and an important one it is, number five. The right, <laughs> the, how, you know, the, the planetary survival. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's right. Um, the, the zero hour doesn't have new funding from uh, fossil fuel companies, and maybe we had to skip over number five. <laughs> <laughs> oh, number five is the back. don't look up one. <laughs> yeah. The yes, right, right to a clean environment and secure planet, uh, which could have been, I suppose, a bridge to the right, right to a planet. Um, yeah, right. So uh, clearly this is, or at least clearly in some context, this is the or issue from which all others uh, on which all others depend, right? If we, we don't have a livable planet, we're not going to be able to get any of these other yeah. uh, things for ourselves. Um, anything we should know about, uh, thoughts about the phrasing here? It's an economic bill of rights. So in this sense, I assume we would assume that he, in the economic context, you just can't get by a, a, and have a, a decent life economically if the environment is poisoned and the planet is threatened. I assume that's the thinking. Yeah, well, just to put it in some kind of historical context, I always used to tell my students that back when I was a kid, people talked about conservation, uh, which was right. left over in many ways from the New Deal years, civilian conservation corps and so on. And what we've seen over these many years is an understanding of not only conservation for the sake of national parks or clean you know, streets, it's also the idea that we, we need a decent, healthy environment which would also play into the whole question of people's health, right? On, and then beyond that to the planet. Um, one of the things we've come to realize is, of course, that environmental justice is not only, if you like, a countryside question, it's all the more an urban question. How many neighborhoods were built upon waste dumps, right, that were ca cancer causing? Those are the kinds right. of things that immediately come to my mind. Right. Now, here's a, here is... Uh, item six, 
Um, you mentioned the economist Derek Hamilton earlier, and he's a he's a friend. And I sense Derek's hand in this: the right to a meaningful endowment of resources at birth and a secure retirement. the The first half of that sounds like Derek Hamilton's and others' proposals for so called baby bonds to be issued to Americans upon birth, uh, particularly uh, among other things essential to closing the racial wealth gap. And the latter, of course, covers Social Security and any number of other provisions as well. But what should we know about item six? Okay, Alan, you, you, what you're going to say is going to be more important, but I just want to preface it with a little historical note. One of the reasons that, that I was at first not sure about this, and but oddly enough, as Alan and I were talking, I was reminded of what Thomas Paine, who is the father right. of the idea of Social Security, called for. Not only for a secure retirement, not only that is for Social Security as we think of it, he also called for grants for STAKE stakes to young people to guarantee that they won't start out in poverty and that they would have an opportunity, education, a business, or to buy land. And I said, yeah, it's very much in the original American founder's mind, that kind of thing. Alan, I'll leave it to you then. To well, I just want to say that uh, Richard is an exceptionally, uh, you get an A uh, for your close reading in literature. That is a taken word for word, that phrase from the Hamilton, Darity, and Paul proposal. And, um, and I think it's, uh, it just makes sense as economic justice. We have incredible disparities of wealth and entrenched poverty uh, in terms of the term over from generation to generation. It's a reality in our society. Everybody knows it, and it needs to be addressed in an economic bill of rights. And who among us uh, is more of an American writer than Thomas Paine, who I believe made that proposal in agrarian justice, right? Exactly, in the 1790s. That's right. All right. So let's go to uh, item seven, the right to sound banking and financial services. I, I find it hard to resist the impulse to want to introduce sound and non larcenous banking and financial services. <laughs> yes, for we, de sure. we definitely should have talked to you when we were doing this. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and of course, this again, this could include any number of proposals, including public banking, postal banking, or, or uh, yeah. any variety of services. But uh, uh, anything else you guys were thinking of in this? Well, I do want to say that my students, I, I'm here in Wisconsin in case people don't realize. My students who come from central and northern Wisconsin, rural areas, they do lament the fact that many a, a northern and central Wisconsin community do not have adequate banking resources, adequate financial services. And I, I can tell you that there are those of my students who envision a political career, and I think that will be on their political platform. Well, I'm glad. It means you are seeding ideas in the generation <laughs> to come, which is a... Uh, professor's role. Um, we so have, we have food deserts, health deserts, economic opportunity deserts, and we certainly have banking deserts, and we have usurious loans that uh, with spectacular interest rates are all that's available in many of these places. So it's an absolute necessity that this be part of an economic bill of rights. Well said. And we're already well over time, but uh, one more to go. Uh, the right to recreation and participation in public life, which sounds to me like the economic economic uh, sibling of um, the happiness portion of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The right well said. Well, more, more than that, more than that. Yes, the first point, and we got, we've, been, we've been actually told that the word recreation might be a little archaic, and it's not so much in common parlance these days. The, the language is that word is taken from Roosevelt. It's true. But look, we don't have a guaranteed vacation time. Uh, in the United States right. of America, and that should be uh, that should be a, a federal law that we should have at least two weeks and really more uh, vacation time for everybody who works uh, their job at a living wage and a job guarantee set up. Then uh, participation in public life um, that means uh, we uh, that is also there because we do have our democracy under attack right now. We have to have a vibrant democracy where everybody has the opportunity to participate and have their voices heard in what is the decision-making process for our society, which is our democracy. So the freedom of time for, for leisure, for recreation, for vacation, and to participate. Because we know the people who, we have people who just work three, four jobs, there's no way they can go to any civic meetings right. and participate in public life. And if I get, I, 
again, some historical notes. The first one I may, want to make is that the commission that helped craft what was then articulated by FDR's Economic Bill of Rights, they used the term the right to adventure. Hmm. Okay, the right to adventure. And I still find a certain, I have a certain affection for that term. The second thing I want to say is the participation in public life. If one goes back in time and looks at what Eleanor Roosevelt was calling for, while, El- while Franklin was calling for the four freedoms, she talked about the four equalities and participation in public Public life was very much a part of those of that for her, and she was speaking especially to African American audiences at that time, trying to trying to, if you like, encourage them in in the civil rights direction. And I mean, we could reduce it in some ways to a singular moment. Why is it that we do not have a day free of work to vote? Right. right. And also the great inversion of public enemy, inverting the Beastie Boys, where you have to fight for your right to party. Public enemy, you have to party for your wait. <laughs> no, no, party I, for your right to fight. Right, that's party it. for your right to fight. Because what we need, look, if you, and this goes to uh, the brilliant work of the uh, social theorist Mark Fisher in his critique of the incredible explosion of creativity that existed from working class communities around the world in the 1960s is predicated upon this kind of social contract where you have the freedom to not only party more and better, but also to to create and to have time to write songs, to be a painter, to be an artist, to be a writer. All, all of that is squeezed in our current situation where people work, again, two, three, four jobs. They have no freedom and they live in a life of debt precarity. So again, this is very important that we have the right not just to participate in public life, but recreation also means the opportunity to to, to fully uh, to uh, to be yourself and to fulfill your opportunities and your own vision for your life. So now that I've totally blown my time limits altogether, uh, let's just take a minute before we go and say, uh, Alan and Harvey, where are you going with this now? Where are you taking this now? Well, I'll start. And then Alan, as the executive director of Progressive Democrats of America, can perhaps go beyond whatever I say. So this this Economic Bill of Rights, I believe, right now can gain traction. I think Americans yearn for this just as they did in 1943 and 1944 under Franklin Roosevelt. And I can tell you that so far, the, we've had remarkably enthusiastic response when we do these kinds of shows. And I'll also add that here in Wisconsin, Christina Shelton, my state representative, and Francesca Hong from Madison have introduced to the Democratic Party caucuses a Wisconsin Economic Justice Bill of Rights that has been now in, in play for about a year as a conversation piece. And on March 21st, just 10 days away, basically, they will relaunch it. I will be there and others on the floor of the state capitol, hoping that the Democrats will f- truly embrace it and in time will actually win enough seats in the state legislature to make it real. I'll also tell you that I, we've had responses from se- not only folks who that PDA have endorsed, but also from folks in New Hampshire. There's a state assembly person there who I'm talking to this week, and she has ideas to how to promote it nationally at the state level. A state senator from Massachusetts contacted me yesterday. I mean, it, I think I think there is that yearning. I think this is the moment, but I'll leave it to Alan to, to, fr- from this point. Um, yeah, we, uh, from the sacred to the profane, obviously this is inspired by uh, Roosevelt, by uh, his uh, second to final State of the Union speech in 1944, the great work of A. Philip Randolph, Martin Luther King Jr. But on the profane side, also, I was particularly irked by one of Bill Maher's recent new rules, where he was defining the progressive movement in the United States entirely along the lines of cancel culture and a negative understanding of wokeness. And so this is what the progressive stands for. They want to, they're, they're Stalinists who want to suffocate your right to speak as you feel comfortable speaking. And that's all that they're about. Boulder Dash. I worked very closely with our legislating lobbying wing with PDA throughout the last year and up on Capitol Hill. There was not a progressive who wasn't constantly pushing the, the solid core of the progressives, Pramila Jayapal, the squad, Bernie Sanders, over and over again to strengthen the economic component of Build Back Better. That's what the progressive movement is, is core. It's the only political movement in the country right now that is asking for a reconfiguration of our social economic contract along the lines of what Professor Kay and I have attempted to, and I believe hopefully successfully achieved in laying out here in the 21st century economic bill of rights. This will be an American society that is America at its best. 
we will be addressing the great sins of uh, the legacy of structural racism to a strong degree in this, not fully adequately. There's other components, of course, that have to be mixed in there, but, but this is an essential uh, template for the progressive movement we feel moving forward that will attract and appeal to Americans right now at this moment and let people know that this is really what we're about and the focus of our movement and not uh, these marginal things, which, you know, from Tucker Carlson to Karl Rove to Bill Maher, people try to denigrate the progressive movement, put it in the box and write it off. So that's really what I think this is about at this moment. Let's rally around this and let's win some midterms. Well, Alan Minsky, executive director of Progressive Democrats of America and Harvey J.K., historian and sociologist and author. Thanks to you both for your great work on this. Uh, good luck with it. I hope you'll come back and let us know how it's going. And thanks for coming on the program. Thank you. I'm looking forward to the song. Yes. Oh, well, OK. Uh, we'll see. Uh, Sammy Khan, the great songwriter, was asked, which comes first, the music or the lyrics? He said, the check. <laughs> Check comes for, but and anyway, thanks for coming on the program. Thank we'll be you. right back after this. I am Richard R. J. Escow, and this is the Zero Hour.